Hi guys. Um, thanks for your patience in um, me getting to this lecture. This was in fact uh, the view of my house later today. Um, actually it's not, but that's what it felt like. So again, thanks for your patience. All right, so what I want to talk about to you today is um, error detection on uh, at the link layer, as well as address resolution protocol um, for uh, transmissions at the link layer um, on end-to-end -end basis. Okay, one thing at a time. So first is error detection. So as I mentioned to you guys, uh, when we talked about the transport layer, there are checksums included in those packets, which allows you to detect errors on end-to-end -end basis. Um, as it turns out, there's also error detection, error correction on the link layer on hub-by-hub -hub basis. Why would we want to do that? Well, Detecting errors on end-to-end -end basis is great because we know ultimately the destination knows if the data it received is correct. But we also want to detect errors on hub-by-hub -hub basis, right, as the packet makes its way um, across, a trans across a path. Because if we can detect errors early on that path, we can either correct them or ask for a retransmission before they're allowed to accumulate um, on end-to-end -end basis. So hub-by-hub -hub mechanisms allows us for allow us to do early retransmissions or correction um, for performance. So we don't have to ask for end-to-end -end retransmissions, but end-to-end -end error detection allows us for to guarantee correctness for the receiver. Okay, so let's focus on error detection on um, hub-by-hub basis. So what we have as the general model is some data that we want to send. Um, and then we want to be able to deliver the data at the next hop, uh, possibly for transmission later on um, or on the next hop. So what happens is we start with a, with a datagram and then that datagram contains the data bits. We're going to add some error detection and correction bits onto this okay, that somehow protect this data or encode it. Um, we'll then transmit this whole frame over an error prone link and we'll get D prime and EDC prime, possibly changed with bits flipped in this transmission. Okay, we can then check D against ED, D prime against EDC prime, and if those match, meaning that they're the same as these, then we can pass that datagram on either to the receiver, or to the transport layer, or onto the next hub. Or if these don't match, we can correct this error potentially, or just reject that packet. Um, right away. So even if we can't correct the error, at least we're not wasting network resources forwarding data that's, that we already know is wrong. Okay, this is not 100% correct. It's still possible that um, this, error, this um, error checking checks out and we end up forwarding bad data, um, but the end-to-end -end mechanism should still be able to detect it because this is just one frame of, of many that could con uh, comprise a, um, a a packet or a, a stream transmission. Okay, so um, let's start with a very simple mechanism called parity checking. What we're going to do is take the bits D and then we'll add a parity bit as the XOR of these bits. And so if one of these bits flips, the result is not going to match the parity bit and so we're able to detect this error or possibly the parity bit itself could flip. Okay, we don't know, but either way we could reject this transmission. But what happens is that errors often flip in bursts, meaning adjacent bits would flip. And so if these two bits flip, um, then the D portion is wrong, but we might not be able to detect it just with a single parity bit. So we need something more powerful. And so we can do this in two dimensions. We take our data D and we divide it into a matrix. And then we can have parity rows and parity columns of our uh, data D. And so if our data D is this portion, or basically these bits followed by these bits followed by these bits, we can divide it into, split it into a matrix and then compute parity columns and parity rows. And then we can do a parity bit of these parity bits. Okay? And so if, if this bit flips from one to zero, Okay, we'll see that this row no longer checks out. Okay, the parity bit is wrong. And in this column, the parity bit is wrong. 
which allows us to center on this bit, which is flipped, and then flip it back, right? So we might be able to actually correct the error um, at the receiver or at the receiving hub. Now, this only allows us to deal with a small number of bit flips, um, and so we want something more powerful. And so comes the cyclic redundancy check, or CRC. And that can tolerate an arbitrary number or detect an arbitrary number of um, errors in a burst. Okay, so as before, we're going to view our data D as a binary number. And then the sender and receiver will agree on an R plus one bit generator G with whose leftmost digit is one. Okay, so that's um, basically a number. The G is a number that's agreed on or well known to um, I hard coded at the sender and the receiver. Okay, so what we want then is to compute R, which is big R, which is going to be R bits long, such that when we take D and we shift it left by R, and then XOR that number with um, big R, we're going to get some multiple of G, okay, or NG. Right, and you also observe that if you shift D left by R and then XOR it with R, big R, the result is the same thing as appending big R to big D, yeah? which basically allows us to create a frame of our D bits followed by R bits of CRC. Okay? Question is how to compute this magic R. Turns out it's quite easy. So what we can do is take D, shift it left by R, and then mod it, modulo 2, um, find the remainder with G, which will then produce R. Okay, so R is nothing but the remainder of this operation. Okay. Then we can make another observation that the XOR operation we used here <clears throat> is actually the same as in, in modulo 2 as, um, as the subtraction. Okay. So if look at these bits and these bits, and then if we XOR them together, this is the result which is the same thing of subtracting these two numbers. Okay, So what you see is that <clears throat> if we look at D shifted left by R minus R, that's the same thing as D shifted left by R uh, X or R. Either way, the result is going to be NG, right? If you take this number, D shifted left by R, and then you subtract the remainder, Okay. then what you should get is a multiple of G, which is what we get here. So this allows the receiver to then check if the arriving data is correct. Um, what the receiver does is it takes the D bits arriving in a frame and it shifts them left by R and then XORs this with the CRC bits. Okay. And then it can mod it with G, which is known to it, and if the result is zero, okay, meaning there's um, there's no remainder, that means that D matches R and none of the bits have flipped in the packet. Okay, and the G is no, well known to the sender and receiver for 32 bits. This is the uh, the generator number. And as I mentioned before, um, this is widely used in Ethernet and 802.11. Okay. So here's a numerical example of, to make this a little bit easier. Let's see. Let's say that we start with some number D. This is these are the bits we want to send, and we have some generator G, one zero one one. Okay. So first thing is we want to compute R, which is shifting D by R and modding it with G. Okay. Um, and this gives us the remainder one hundred one. Now on the receiver, uh, the receiver gets the packet shifts the D bits left by R, by little r, subtract the remainder, okay, that was included in the packet as the CRC bits, okay, and the result is this, and now modding this result with the generator, okay, we get zero, meaning that um, D matches R and none of the bits have flipped. Okay, so that's CRC. Now let's start talking about actually forwarding data in at the link layer in the network um, in the switch network. Um, 
And to do that, we need to first understand or talk about MAC addresses. So MAC addresses are hardware addresses assigned to your network interface cards. These numbers are 48 bits long and they come from IEEE, that's the assigning authority, which will basically give a big block of these addresses, maybe something that begins with 1A to FBB to some manufacturer of um, network cards and then they're free to assign kind of the remaining numbers to the cards that they produce. Okay, so the analogy of this is that the MAC address is kind of like a social security number. There's one to every uh, person or every device. And if you move around from state to state, you're going to keep your social security number. But um, you might have a different postal address, which is effectively your IP address. So your IP address is something that changes based on your location, whereas your MAC address um, does not. Okay, And so um, the flat MAC address space, right, flat meaning it's not hierarchical, it's not, uh, it, it's, it doesn't, these don't have subnets, um, allows for portability between LANs, meaning you don't need to get it reassigned, it's kind of hard-coded to your hardware, um, but the switch tables, which we'll talk about later, are not hierarchical, which lowers their scalability, as opposed to routers, which can uh, compress their routing tables um, using prefix, prefixes, as we already discussed. Okay, so let's talk about uh, next uh, address resolution protocol, which is basically how to find the mapping between the IP address, which is assigned in each network, um, to an interface card, and um, that card's MAC address, which is actually used for addressing link layer frames. Okay, so each host will maintain an ARP table, um, which um, maps the IP address of some host of, of hosts no, no, known to this node to, the, to their MAC addresses. And this mapping will have some time to live eventually to expire to basically keep the size of this table manageable and not just growing forever and ever and ever. Okay. So, if you want to inspect this on your computer um, in Linux, you can do the following. You can just type in ARP, which will show you your ARP table. And here is, you might see a mapping between your gateway, which is, which is how you can access the rest of the internet and the MAC address of the, of the gateway. Okay. You can also run ifconfig or interface config, which will show you the uh, MAC address of your network card. Okay, and you can see how long these the entries in the Mac um, in the ARP table stay around, which is basically configured in this file, and it's 60 seconds. Okay, so let's see how we can use ARP to discover the how to send the packet to another IP address on our subnet. Okay, so let's say host A wants to send some data to host B. Okay, but B's MAC address is not in A's ARP table. And so to, to form a frame um, where the frame delivers the IP packets to some other destination in this land, right? So that another uh, network card can hear the data and pick it up. Um, we need to discover the mapping between B's IP address uh, and its MAC address, which we don't know yet here, or A doesn't know it yet. Okay, so what happens is that <clears throat> A will issue an ARP request for the IP address of the destination uh, that it wants to send a packet to, okay? And this ARP will be broadcast to the broadcast address, um, uh, the MAC broadcast address, okay? So these ARP requests go to, the, the, to all the different hosts on the local area network, and because um, this IP address is assigned to node B, node B will reply okay, uh, to the ARP address um, of, sorry, to the MAC address of A. Now, um, this is known to host B because the ARP request came from this MAC address, and so um, B can use it to reply with its mapping or its MAC address. OK, 
Okay, and now when A receives this packet, it can in its table uh, basically map the IP address of B to the MAC address of B. Okay? So now from A's point of view, this association is known, and now data can, can be forwarded to transmitted uh, if it's destined for .88, um, A can form link layer frames with the destination being the MAC address of B. Okay. So let's look at how this actually works in a multi-hub network with a router in the middle. Okay, we'll focus here on the on the addressing of, of frames. So we can assume before we start that A knows B's IP address. So A host A is here, host B is here. The question is, how does A know B's IP address? If let's say B is a web server. Well, from the domain name service um, or from DNS, okay? Now we can also assume that A knows the IP address of the first hub router, okay? So it knows how to, A knows how to generate packets or where to send packets that will ultimately be destined for B. How does it know it? From DHCP, right? Remember that DHCP assigns not just your IP address, Okay, but also the address of your, um, of your gateway. Okay, it also lets you know what that is. And then we can assume that A knows R's MAC address. Okay, so it, how does it know it? Basically ARP, right? What we covered before, ARP can allow A to discover the MAC address of this IP, which is its gateway, which it discovered from the HCP. Right? So you can see how all the protocols we discussed thus far work together to deliver different networking information to, um, to each node. Okay, so let's look at a process of um, transmitting data from A to B. So A will form a packet um, with its source IP address and the destination IP address of B that it learned from DNS. Okay, um, so this IP packet will be put into a link layer frame with the source MAC address being the MAC address of A and the destination MAC address being the MAC address of the first hub router or of the, of the gateway. Okay. So that packet gets, that frame gets transmitted, um, router R receives it and strips out the IP packet. Okay, so from the physical layer, the frame is received, it goes to the Ethernet or the link layer, and that strips out the IP packet, which is then forwarded to the router to do routing um, or to do forwarding. Now, the router consults its forwarding table established by whatever routing protocol it has, and it says, oh, okay, great, I need to forward this packet out this interface Okay, to reach here. Okay, so once it forwards it out this interface, okay, it puts that IP packet into another frame with now source address being the MAC address of this interface and the destination MAC address being the uh, destination being the MAC address of the destination. And now that frame arrives at B and now again, it is forwarded to Ethernet, which then strips out the IP packet, which is then forwarded to the transport layer and so on. Okay, so you can see the different protocols working together at each layer to provide you to, to create end-to-end -end connectivity in a network. All right, so here's an exercise for you guys. Um, here's a network, um, and then your tasks are to A, assign all the IP addresses uh, assign IP addresses to all the interfaces, okay? Uh, B, assign MAC addresses to all the adapters, and then consider sending an IP datagram uh, or packet from A to E, A is here, E is here, okay? And um, assume all this, or enumerate all the steps that would happen in the network, okay? So you can pause the video here and kind of consider how would you solve this problem? All right, if you're done considering, um, let's look at some options. 
So first we want to assign all the IP addresses. Okay. So the IP addresses are assigned to hosts. Okay, so we'll have an IP address here, 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 here. Okay, and then they would be different in different subnets. All right. Um, but also we can assign IP addresses, we need to assign IP addresses to interfaces of routers. Okay, that are in this that that are that participate in the different subnets. The next thing we can do is assign MAC addresses. Okay, and MAC addresses are assigned to all the network cards. So basically, where we have IP addresses, this is going to look like a Christmas tree pretty soon. Okay, but also there are MAC addresses on the switches, um, which are here, 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 and here. Okay, that's all of them, I think. Okay, so basically every IP, every network card will have a MAC address, but also switches in these networks can have MAC addresses, even though they don't have IP addresses. Okay, so now we want to send an IP datagram from A to E. Okay, so we can assume, um, for simplicity, that A knows its um, first hop router, which is here. Okay, um, so what would happen is it would send an ARP packet, be, be broadcast, okay, which would go. Uh, to here. Now, depending how this uh, switch runs, if this is a hub or a switch, we assume this is a switch, um, it would also be transmitted on this link and this link. And then um, the first operator would reply with ARP. Okay, there would be an ARP request and an ARP reply. And so this is going this direction, this is going that direction. Okay. And now we would be able to, after resolving the ARP, we'd be able to transmit the data packet um, or data frame from here to here. Okay. From there, the router would need to make a forwarding decision of which interface to forward this data on. Okay. For to do this, there would have needed to be some sort of a routing protocol happening here conveying the availability or the reachability of subnet three, okay, via this router. Okay? So that means that there would have already been a IP packet sending reachability information from this router to this router. Okay? So now this router knows that the forwarding decision needs to, that it needs to forward data for an IP address um, in subnet three via this interface. Okay. So there's an IP packet being sent here. And now the question is, do we need to go through ARP or not to send it to this interface? Well, if there's a routing protocol, that probably means that they are exchanging reachability information, which means that ARP has already been, been um, run to discover the mapping between this IP and this um, MAC address. Most likely, unless ARP needs to be refreshed, we can simply send the IP packet here, and then this router also consults a forwarding table, and then the question is, does it need to do ARP here or not? Right. Well, um, it may know that it can reach a, all the IP addresses in subnet 3, right? because it's basically forward data to a subnet, but it still may not know the actual MAC address of this node. And so there may need to be an ARP process here with a reply from E. And then finally an IP packet going in that direction. Okay. So you can see there are different steps being taken that need to be taken to establish this end-to-end -end reachability. Of course, this is kind of on the first, uh, uh, first packet being sent. Um, thereafter, once we know the mappings from 
um, IP addresses to Mac, we can just forward um, IP packets without doing the ARP rediscovery. All right, so that's it for today. Again, I apologize for this lecture being delayed. Uh, I will see you guys synchronously on Wednesday. I'm excited about it. All right, thank you. Bye.